Welcome to the Hold the Line podcast. Sean Foyt here, and we are coming to you live from Washington, D.C., Stone's Throw from the Capitol Building. And I'm here with such a hero and a legend <laughs> and somebody we all love and appreciate, Congressman Jim Jordan. Yeah, well, those those terms may fit you, but I'm just a country, <laughs> country boy from Ohio, but it is, uh, it is good to be with you. Yeah, thank you. Thank you. We're super honored, and we're so grateful, first of all, for how you've backed not only the fight for religious liberty, but getting behind us with Let Us Worship. Yeah. And we're really, really thankful and just so excited to be here. And, well, I, and I love fighters. Well, um, <laughs> we love what you do. And um, you're doing the hard work. You're out there talking to people about their faith, about a saving knowledge of the, of the Savior who came, bled, and died, and rose again for us. So we appreciate that. I just, I just try to debate liberals in Congress and hold people accountable <laughs> who did wrong and when we're having hearings, so uh, you're doing you're doing the Lord's work literally, and um, we appreciate that. Well, thank you so much. Thank you. We, uh, I'd love to start by just getting into a little bit of your history, your passion. How'd you get into politics? Some of that kind of stuff. Yeah, it's you know my background's a sport of wrestling. Uh, I always jokingly tell people when I was in grade school, I had life figured out. I knew what I was gonna do because I grew up in the 70s, and I loved sports, and, and the winning team was the Pittsburgh Steelers, so I knew, <laughs> I knew I was going to play middle linebacker for the Pittsburgh oh, Steelers, because okay. I loved, I loved uh, the Steel Curtain, you know, Mean Joe Green, and all these, but my favorite guy was Jack Lambert. And I, so wait, Ohio. you were a Steelers fan, not even a though from, fan. Yeah, I was, okay. even though from Ohio, because okay. uh, you know, you're, when you're a dumb kid, you like yeah. winners, and the Steelers were winning everything in the 70s, and um, but I, I quickly learned that the good Lord had had, had other designs because I'm five seven and a half on a good day. And, <laughs> so uh, got into the sport of wrestling and did that forever, and and it's been great for our family. My our boys wrestled in college. My nephews, my brother and I, we just grew up wrestling, and that's that's what you did at our school. Um, so that was that was great and was doing that. But when you get married and have kids, you know you you've got four of your own and a lovely wife, and so. You just look at the world different. Yeah. And I was looking for a new... I was assistant wrestling coach at Ohio State. I'd done that for several years. Um, it was time to try to be a head coach in the Big Ten or do something else. And I was. I got interested in politics. And, um, you know, government taking your money, telling you what to do, you get tired of all that. And I thought, you know what? The state rep retired. And I said, I'm going to run. And no one gave us a chance. No one gave us a chance. Some wow. young Joe Bag of Donuts. And uh, I still remember talking to the party leaders, because where I'm from in West Central Ohio, it's largely about winning the primary. And I remember talking to the party leaders in our home county. I said, I think I'm running for state rep. I'm going to run for state rep. And they were like, well, you're a nice young guy, but this two-term county commissioner has been in politics. He's running. You know, he's going to win, you know. Yeah. And, and, and I politely said, we'll see, you know. There's a reason they play the game on Friday night, find out who's going to win. And yeah. I said, you know, we'll see. And and we just had a bunch of good people, homeschoolers, pro-life people help us out. We knocked on doors and beat the tar out of this guy. Wow. And that was in 1994 and been in politics ever since. Wow. So when did you make that jump from state to federal? So I was state rep for six years, okay. uh, three terms. And then um, in 2000, ran for state senate. We had this more than you want to know, but we had the distinction of at that time the most expensive state senate primary in the history of Ohio because I ran against the the party's picked guy. Two state reps ran. He was in leadership. He was endorsed by the governor, the speaker of the house, the president of the senate, the attorney general. He was endorsed by a guy named John Boehner. He was a pretty important congressman at the time. Um, and, you know, no one really endorsed me, And we, but we did the same thing. You just... It's yeah. just the old American story. If you have a goal, you have a dream, and you're willing to work hard, a lot of times good things happen. And we... Uh, did the same, knocked on a bunch of doors and worked really hard and wound up winning that race. And so did was in the state Senate for six years and then ran for Congress in 2006 and been here in Washington ever since. Okay. And so, and you were, you, when you got in, you were, it was the Obama years, right? Uh, yep. Yeah. Okay. Oh, no, 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 excuse me. I, I won in six. It was the last two years Bush. of the Bush years. Okay. And then, of course, uh, that's the year that, that Republicans lost the House. And there was only like 13 of, us, 13 of us in that class of Republicans, a bunch of Democrats, because they, they had the big way for the Democrats. And then so we were in the minority through 2010 when we won it back. Um, so, yeah, we, I've, been on, I've been on both sides yeah, so a couple Bush, times. Bush, Obama, Trump, yeah. Biden. How has that been, just that? Well, the best, the best four years were obviously President Trump. Um, I mean, I, I just so appreciate, you know, he, 
he came into office and got more done of, of, of what he had told the American people he was going to accomplish, did more of that than any president, certainly in my lifetime, maybe in history. Yeah. And I love the guy. I love I loved the way he fights. I love the, the, the fact that he truly loves this country, yeah. loves our military, our, yeah. our veterans, our law enforcement, and regular people who make the country a special place. And uh, he came in and, and, and got things done in spite of everyone against him. I mean, every Democrat was against him. Um, everyone in the mainstream press was against him. Everyone in the bureaucracy was against him. And a bunch of Republicans yeah, were against him. Yeah, his own him. party. Yeah. And still, he got stuff done. And, and, and unprecedented opposition, like from the FBI, had figured out that they were spying on him and right, two impeachments. Right, and right. So, um, definitely. How did President you Trump. find yourself in the middle of that whole thing? So, when you were defending him and all that stuff, how did you. Part of it's just just the nature of my uh, the, the committees I'm on. Right. You know, when you're on the oversight committee and then you're also on the judiciary committee, you're just you're just in the middle of it all. Um, and my I don't know why, but uh, the, the history it seems like every big issue or scandal that's happened in this town, I've been in the middle of the investigation. Yeah. So when it was the IRS targeting um, folks folks like my mom and dad and others, just just conservative people right, who were right. Tea Party yeah. groups that, mm-hmm. ten years ago, we were in the middle of that uh, investigation. I was I was. Um, was on the Benghazi Select Committee when we lost four amazing Americans. Yeah, that 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 September 11th, uh, 2012, that night. Um, and then of course impeachment. And part of the impeachment, Leader McCarthy came to me when the Democrats were going down this road and said, um, "I'm going to put you." Because if you remember, Adam Schiff it was chair of Intel, and it was in the Intelligence Committee, and then it was passed off to the Judiciary Committee. Mm-hmm. Well, I'm not on the Intelligence Committee, but. Um, Leader McCarthy came to me and says, "I want, I want you to, I'm going to temporarily put you on this committee because of this impeachment, where we yeah. did the depositions down there in the bunker in the basement of the Capitol, and and so just been in the middle of all this. It seems like um, by nature of our assignments, and and um, and then of course Kevin put me on Intel. Well, when I saw uh, I saw you, you know, when they opened that whole thing, and I saw you doing some opening arguments and stuff, I was like, good Lord, they picked a fight with the wrong guy. Well, this is going to be a ride, yeah, you know? Well. And it was, it was, it was, it, I was so impressed and man, it was, it was really, really, how do you feel like your faith has impacted either the decisions you make or the battles that you fight or how has it influenced things in the, in your time in Congress? Well, what I try to do is just get to the truth, and particularly when you reference like some of the hearings and, and, right. you know, I'm given the opportunity. I, I always re- try to remember this. Only about 12,000 people in the history of our country, the greatest nation ever, only about 12,000 people have had the opportunity to serve in the United States Congress. So it's a privilege. And right. you, I get the chance to represent three quarters of a million people back home. And they expect me to come here and do what I told them I was going to do, do what they elected me to do. And by again, by the nature of my committee assignments, a lot of it is involved cross-examining witnesses. Right. And so I try to get prepared for it just same way I did for like a wrestling match. And I view it as a competition. It's like, if I think that witness hasn't been square with the folks I get the privilege of representing, right. it's my job to point that out right. and get the truth out there um, so the country knows really what happened. And that's how I approached it with um, the Benghazi hearing. I remember when I got a chance to the question... Uh, Secretary Clinton back in 2016. Mm-hmm. It's the way I approached it with people at the IRS who were targeting right. Americans for exercising their First Amendment liberties. And it's exactly how I approached it during impeachment, where I thought the Democrats were totally denying President Trump due process, coming after him on a bogus claim. Um, and so that's just how I view it. And it's, 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 I view it as almost, like I said, like a, it's, it's the closest thing that an old guy like me gets to a wrestling match. Um, in, in, in competing and in, in, in the goal being to get the truth out there. Well, and I feel like, you know, for so many Americans, I think all of these scandals and these things, it gets so overwhelmed. It's yeah. like, ah, it's like, yeah. it's hopeless. You know, yeah. why even do it? Why even contend with it? But, but you've been able to really not only expose stuff, but really fight and give people hope when you're fighting. Like, hey, listen, this is worth fighting for. America's worth fighting for. These issues that are happening – what is your encouragement as, and I want to get into some of the specifics of the things that we're facing right now, but what is your encouragement to people that, like, it's like, I can't handle anymore, I'm just going to zone out, yeah. turn, turn it off, you know, disengage? Yeah, great question. And it, it's funny you bring it up. T- 
today because a few weeks ago we had a, uh, a hearing with the Attorney General, and, and there are things that are going on in the Justice Department that I think are just dead wrong, particularly the way they're treating parents, moms right. and dads at, you know, showing up at school board meetings. <coughs> so, and it, that whistleblower report yeah, that came yeah, out. Yeah, exactly. But in that hearing, I was walking through um, this, this issue with, you know, the, the letter that came in and the memorandum that the Attorney General sent out mm-hmm. targeting parents and, and, and basically setting up a spy line, a snitch line for parents and the, the, what, what was contained in his memo. And I said at the end of my opening remarks, I said, I think a great reawakening is beginning to happen Come where, on. where people are saying, you know what? And, and it and, and it may be a spiritual element to it right. as well. Yeah. Um, but it's like we're not gonna. We're tired of this. The 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 attacks on our on our rights on our mm-hmm. liberties, and it this issue of government telling parents, we know better than you do about your children. That's not gonna fly. And that's sort of I think been this this almost like catalyst for people saying, wait a minute, I've had enough of this. And moms and dads showing up in this context, showing up at a school board meeting. Yeah. I always say courage is contagious. Yes. And you get it. I mean, I also say like, you know, no, no, uh, I, don't, I don't, I don't, I haven't had the uh, pleasure of meeting your wife, but, but it's like, my, my guess is she's like, like my mom and, 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 and my, and my wife, um, no high paid lobbyist, no bureaucrat, no government official is ever going to beat a mom on a mission. And these moms <laughs> showing true. up and you know, defending their kids. Yeah. Yeah. They're the, the best advocate you could ever have. And, that energy, that um, that courage is contagious, and I think you're seeing that. You saw it in the Virginia election, um, but that's a darn good thing. And it's I think waking up more Americans. Like, look, we need to we need to push back on some of this stuff and and defend the principles that made America a special place. Well, yeah, and I I, I would ag- agree too. I mean, the reawakening message. I mean that that I feel like you know we're, of course we're seeing it across America yeah. spiritually, right? right? People are like, okay. You know, the COVID stuff, the lockdowns, the intensity, the election, the, the heaviness of all this season. And it's like, this is one of the reasons I love I love to gather people to worship. I love, to, it's like a recentering, a refocusing. But okay. it's also like, okay, like we are responsible for this hour that we're alive in history. Yeah. Like, and we can't just zone out. You know, we can't just become overwhelmed. It's almost like... I love, you know, the David and Goliath story I think is so profound because the whole nation was lulled to sleep, yeah. you know, by the chanting of this giant. Yeah. And it took, it took a shepherd boy to step into that environment yeah. to say, hey, listen, what, what's wrong with you guys? Yeah. Yeah. You know, how do you, dare you defy the armies of the living God, right? Yeah. Seemed a little bit a little bit like arrogant, yeah. but it was actually confidence in sure who the Lord called him to be. So in the same way, I think parents are waking up. They're seeing what's going on. They're like, no, we have a voice. We can do something. It's like a grassroots mobilization. Yeah. How, how do we focus on, as we're nearing the midterms, all these different issues, how do we, like, do you feel like we can win on the culture war? Oh, yeah. Oh yeah, it, it's so funny that I hadn't thought of that comparison. But yeah, this the, what, what's the term? The ruddy, you know, youngest kid of, of Jesse's yeah. kids steps forward and shows the the nation of Israel how how yeah, how well, we can and, do it. And the forgotten son—that's the crazy yeah, part—is right. that when Jesse came to anoint, you know, uh, the next king, they couldn't yeah. even find him. Yeah, like he was he yeah, was right. forgotten. Nathan goes, "You got any others? Right, right, any right, others? right." And uh, here comes the kid, and uh, that's the one. Um, no, that's that's special, and and you, then you think about that the the kid that, and then it's moms at a school board meeting, and like right. that's the catalyst. Uh, so yeah, I do think that that is um, that is happening because Americans, you think about it over the last year, every single liberty we enjoy as Americans has under the First Amendment has been assaulted, every single one. You got yeah. five fundamental rights under the First Amendment. Your right to practice your faith, mm-hmm. your right to petition your government, your right to assemble, freedom of the press, freedom of speech. Everyone's been attacked. I mean, th- there are still places today as we speak where a full congregation can't meet on a Sunday morning. It's insane. It's like in America. And it, I, I always tell the story, this is probably six, seven months ago, I spoke to the New Mexico, your right to assemble, I spoke to the New Mexico Republican Party in Amarillo, Texas, because they had to go to Texas to get the freedom to assemble because their governor wouldn't let them. And then... then until just a few weeks ago, 
you couldn't come to your capital to lobby your member of Congress to redress your grievances because Speaker Pelosi wouldn't let you in. Your own darn capital that you pay for right here in our nation's capital. And then, you, you, but the biggest one in, in, in my mind is, is what's happening to freedom of speech. Because I tell everyone, if you can't talk, right. if you're not allowed to speak, nothing else matters. And, and frankly, I would argue in the First Amendment, even though freedom of religion is the first right mentioned, the most important right is freedom of speech. Because if you can't speak, if you can't communicate, how do you practice your faith? How do you share your right. faith? So uh, this attack on speech from the, from the woke mob and from the cancel culture mob is the scariest thing we see. And, and more important than all, yeah, yeah. Uh, big tech and everything right. else, yeah. more important, that's more important than all the other bad things. And all those other things we got to fix too, the border, the tax policy, the spending, the inflation, all that. But the most, because it's fundamental, if you can't speak out, if you're not, if they censor that, and right now, more than half of the country, according to polling, more than half the country is afraid to speak their mind because they're like, oh, is the, is the, Barry Weiss had a great term when she, when she left the New York Times, and she wasn't on the right, she was actually more on the left, but she left and, and she talked about that, that if, you know, if you didn't conform to the, to the, to, to, you know, the group think, if you engage in what she said, wrong speech or wrong think, you would face, and the term she used I thought was so appropriate, she says, you will face the digital Thunderdome. It's coming after you if you disagree. Right. And I'm sure you've had it, we've all had it, but um, we gotta stand up to that. And I think, again, maybe it's, I keep coming back to it, but maybe it's these, it's moms and dads standing up at a school board meeting saying, I don't want this racist, hate America curriculum taught to my kid. Maybe that's the catalyst for us all standing up and defending the First Amendment. That's, I mean, it, it, you're right. It's such a scary, scary season. And I think, you know, when we started our journey with, with Let Us Worship in, in, in California, and I wasn't as, I mean, Gavin Newsom did what he was going to do, right? Like, he, if strip clubs were open, you'd go to Costco, churches were shut down, whatever. I just could not believe how many Christians were complying. Mm. That's the part to me that I was like, and I spent enough time in the Middle East uh, in, in persecuted nations, just got back from Iraq a couple of days ago, where, I mean, I've been with the church that literally has no rights, yeah. you know, and they, they don't even cower. Like, they're, yeah. they're risking their life to practice their faith. Yeah. But yet we saw so many people, why do you think that is? And, and what has to change in the mindset of Christians to not allow these rights to continue to be eroded? Well, I, I think maybe we're, we're at that point where Americans are pushing back. I, I really do. Yeah. And, and, and again, how you push back in America is, is we have the election process. Right. And that's, that's, the, that's the day of the year that, that you get to show up and, and make your voice heard in a, in a you know, straightforward, clear. That's how we do it in America. You have the debate, show up on election day and decide who you're going to put into uh, positions of of leadership and, and positions of decision making. So um, that's how we do it, and we saw it play out in Virginia. I mean, the blue state, no yeah. one thought no one thought Terry McAuliffe was gonna lose the, the race for, for governor. But um, you had what took place in these in these uh, school boards, uh, in schools where they were trying to teach this, and you had, you coupled that with sort of the dramatic action that came out literally about 10 days prior to the election where we learned the Justice Department the FBI was, in fact, labeling and targeting parents as, quote, domestic terrorists. And now, they didn't say that in, 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 in those, those words, but that, in fact, is, in, in, in fact, what was happening. So that sort of, like, put the, the, the sort of the final touch on, wow, this is really serious, and you saw the, the turnout that you did and, and the results that we did. I mean, who is behind that? Like, what, like where does that initiate it's from? It's the left. It's the left. It's... It's all about chilling speech. The idea is to get you. So I, I always say that uh, one of my, one of my, he's a friend, uh, former member of Congress, is uh, Dennis Kucinich, and Dennis is on the left, and I'm conservative. We're, we don't have the same philosophy on, the, but Dennis is a friend, and he, Dennis came to our oldest daughter's wedding. He would he would give the shirt off his back to help me, and I do the same. He's a friend, um, and Dennis is an old school liberal where truly believes in the First Amendment. Let's have the debate. You get your best hold, make your argument. Right. I'll get my best hold. Let's, let's have the debate and see who wins. That's not today's left. Today's left is you either agree with me or you're not allowed to talk. Right. And if you, and if you try totally. to talk, yeah. 
I'm going to call you a racist, and we're going to try to cancel you. Right. And that is wrong. I, I, I don't. I, Dennis can say whatever he wants. I disagree with him. I'll say I, I think that's wrong. Here's what. Here's why I think the policy. Should, right. He thinks I'm wrong. But we have a debate. Shake hands when it's over and see how the vote goes. Well, move, that's how America's supposed to work. That's the First Amendment in action. Today it's not. Today it's it's a it's a totalitarian authoritarian mindset. That's the problem, and we have to push back against that. And I think again, people are waking up to that, and that's why you're seeing seeing more and more folks, um, more and more folks, uh, folks make that argument. So, and it seems like to me, like how much of that, take the Virginia race, for example, how much of that is Republican strategy and how much of that is just simply a groundswell of grassroots mobilizing yeah. parents? And is the Republican strategy focused on the midterms picking up on that cue? Yeah. Like yeah, I think how, I think it's a ladder. I think it's it's, it's how you said the, in the ladder there. I think it is a groundswell of people, and 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 you know politics is a, a, oftentimes a reaction to to right. in, in in reacting to culture uh, in some ways. Um, so I think yeah, it was a groundswell of moms and dads and others saying this is wrong. We're going to stop this. Um, but also then people running for office in positions of leadership who are saying I get it and I agree with you and here's what we're going to do. So. I think the, the policy implication that comes out of that is we should be 110% for school choice. Right. I mean, you, you know, you, you want to tell, you want to tell, tell families out there, um, look, you, you, we think you should be able to decide where your son or daughter is going to get the best education. That's your choice. Moms, dads are in control. The, let's, let's figure that out. That, that's, I think, the, the, the issue we need to camp. We're, not, we're against this crazy curriculum. We want you to make the decision about what's in the best interest of your kids. And I always... I always say, you know, the first institution the good Lord put together wasn't the church, it wasn't the state, it's it was family. moms and dads and kids. Yeah. Very first institution. So let's honor that institution and say to moms and dads, you should get to decide where your kid goes to school and the resources, your tax money, your hard-earned property tax, income tax, everything else you pay to government, it should follow your kid to where you think they're going to get the best education. That's 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 the empowering message that we need to couple with this idea that we're going to be against this this crazy curriculum that they were trying to teach to kids. Wow. The um, it seems like that Americans are wholesale rejecting the product that the Democrats are putting out there. Like it's just a bad product. Yeah. Yeah. You know nobody nobody wants it. People don't like it. It's not popular. How 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 can we capitalize on that aspect of it? You know, I mean, some of it is just saying, "Listen, this is this legislation is crap. Yeah. Like, yeah, it does no good. It doesn't address the needs right now. How how I guess how bad is it going to get for certain people to like wake up? Well, I think that's already happened. I mean, this has been the worst ten months to a new administration in in certainly my lifetime and maybe history. Um, I mean, I have, I have constituents walk up to me or I have, we travel a lot, so you have just fellow citizens walk up to me and go, I didn't think it could get this bad in 10 months. Because, I mean, literally, you can go down the list. We went from energy independence to having right. the spectacle of the President yeah. of the United States beg OPEC to increase production. We went from a secure border to complete chaos. I mean, uh, March was the highest month on record for illegal crossings until April, and then April was the highest month until May, and then May yeah. was the highest month until June, and then June was the highest month until July, where it was 212,000 illegals coming across that the, the border that month alone we've set a record 1.7 million this year alone so we went from stable prices to 30-year high inflation we went from relatively safe cities to crime up in every right. major urban area yeah. violent crime right all because the left had this crazy idea of defunding the police and, and voters pushed back on that on election day as well so um i think the, the country gets it Polling a couple weeks ago showed 71% of our fellow citizens thinks the nation is on the wrong track. My, my question is, who's the 29% who think we're on the right track? There, right. There, there's nothing going well. And all, so Americans get it. But what they're most concerned about is what we talked about just a few minutes ago is, in addition to all that, they're coming after my fundamental liberties as an right. American citizen, the rights I enjoy under the First Amendment. So um, I think they get it in... You know, you never know in politics, but I, I do sense that it's going to be a big change in the 2022 election. And I think there's a really, really good chance that Republicans are in control of the Congress, which is 
I think you good think the they'll take both the House and the I Senate. I do. I do. I think it's. I think you're sensing that kind of, just that kind of feel out there. It's like we didn't, we didn't bargain for this, you know. Um, and, and remember, Joe Biden campaigned. He he won the nomination in South Carolina, and his campaign message was, "I'm not Bernie Sanders." Right. And he won that primary, and that that you know propelled him to the right. nomination. And he ran as moderate Joe, the the. The Scranton Joe, you know, Scranton, Pennsylvania right. Joe, uh, he, he ran as that. And since he got in office, he's been just, the, the first day, yeah. 20 executive orders. One of them was to get rid of the 1770, uh, uh, 1776 commission, which focused on the basic values and principles, the sort of the Judeo-Christian ethic that is the right. backbone of our right. country. And he just, no, we're getting rid of that, what, what, what President Trump had done. And, and here comes critical race theory and everything else right. and a host of other things. So right from the get-go, he he wasn't what he told the American people he right. was going to be. Right. And he has governed hard left since then. So the American people are like, no, we're, we didn't bargain for that. What, what will or what can the Republicans do if they take control again of the House? Like, you, what, you, what, 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 what are they going to do with that equity? Yeah, you, 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 it's, a, it's almost like you're, uh, uh, you, the, the big truck is coming, but we have enough people standing in front pushing it. So you slow it down so much. Hopefully what you do is grind it to a halt so we don't keep having this, this lurch and, and movement to the left. Um, and because we're not going to really be able to pass much and get it into law because, right. you know, we're going to have a I think we're going to have a um, majority in the House, a majority in the Senate. But Joe Biden's not going right. to sign it. Right. Any legislation we pass. So in that two years, you do what what Reagan always talked about. You in politics, you paint in big, bold colors. You show the contrast. So we will. Democrats look like they're going to they're going to raise raise everyone's taxes here this week. So we would pass the bill that would lower their taxes and take it back to the to the Trump. Biden won't sign it, but you set up the contrast. Here's here's the immigration legislation that would actually secure our border, put back in place the policies that were working under President Trump. We pass that. Joe Biden won't sign it. So you frame it up. It's just how American politics works. You frame it up for 2024, um, and when you're going to have, I think, President Trump run against President Biden again, um, and then also during that two years, you we will have subpoena power. And you do the investigations that that need to happen. We do need to know how this this virus started. We we do need to have Dr. Fauci under oath, right. under subpoena, facing the questions that I'd love to ask him. Um, we do need to know how did thousands of Americans' tax returns get made public? That's yeah. not supposed to happen in the United States. It's not supposed to happen in America. That that happened. So there's lots of things we need to investigate. Um, we, we may still need to look at some of the things John Durham's looking at. We don't know how his special counsel investigation is going to, how that's all going to uh, 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 finish out. So those are, that's what you can do in the majority. Uh, you can do the investigations, get the truth out there for the American people so they're, they're completely informed what's happening in their government. I think that one of the, one of the aspects uh, I think that a lot of Americans, I know at least I have dealt with, is like you get excited <clears throat> right when you got the presidency, the House, yeah. the Senate, all you know, all together, and you're like, oh, we're gonna crush! Like this is gonna be amazing. And then stuff still gets stalled. Yeah. I mean, you can't address big tech. You can't address. I mean, there's so many things that you think of. Why did that not happen then? Yeah. And that is what I believe causes a lot of people to lose hope in the whole system. Yeah. Right? Because they're like, we voted, we stood, we did this, yep. and yet. Burn. Can you address any of that? What is no, your it is it is it is so frustrating uh, because yeah, I think there's been times in the past where um, where our party hasn't done what they've said they were gonna do. You know, we right. I, I always say like we make this job too complicated. Right. Uh, you put your name on a ballot, you run for office, you tell the voters if you elect me, I'm gonna do this. If they elect you, if they give you the privilege of serving, you know, as I said, if you're one of those. Ha relatively small number of people have ever had the privilege of serving in Congress. Do what you told them you were going to do, right. for goodness sake. And if you can't do it all, go down fighting, pushing for it, right. doing everything totally. you can to get yeah. there. That's why they elect you. So I, I, I think sometimes I, I wish Republicans had more of that, more of the intensity associated with accomplishing what they were elected to do. Democrats do. When, that, when the, when the oh, left gets do. elected, yeah. holy cow. They go cow. for broke. So, so think about it. We, here, here we are... Um, 
here we are just a couple weeks after the Virginia election, <clears throat> and Democrats are out there saying, no, no, critical race theory is great. Uh, the FBI, no, 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 it, it, it's fine to, you know, they're supporting the stuff that, that lost the, the, you know, that was the issue that was the reason they lost, but they're just full steam ahead. So they um, went from denying it to defending it. Yes. Oh, it doesn't exist. Yes. It's never existed. Oh, you guys. And then it's like, oh, well, actually, it's a good thing. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. And then th they just hard charge. And um, we need a little bit more of that attitude because, again, I think we got the truth on our side. I think it's I think it's just better policy to let moms and dads keep their money versus government right. taking it. I think it's I think it's better policy to actually respect the First Amendment and allow people to have debate. I think it's uh, better policy not to lock down your economy, do common sense, good things that make sense when we're dealing with this virus, but not violate the. Uh, yeah. Remember Bill Barr when when this thing first happened, put out a memo, and the memo said the Constitution is not suspended during a crisis, and amen to that. And I would actually argue. That's when it's most important. Exactly. That's when it counts the yeah. most. So we, we, that, those are the kind of things we have to push for. But I think sometimes Republicans, when they when they get timid, I don't think that's going to happen, though. In, yeah. in, in 20, if we win in 22 and if President Trump wins in 24, I don't think that's going to happen. I think in light of what we've been through and how rapid the left tried right. to usher in all their crazy socialist policies, I think you're going to see Republicans push back in the right way. Well, I, you know... Speaking for probably a lot of conservatives, I think that that's the one piece or the one component that a lot of people don't get is like, you know, it's disheartening when you see 13 Republicans back this last bill. Yeah. You know, it's disheartening when you don't see. And that's when you're kind of like, OK, why are these guys here? They're getting kickbacks in their districts, whatever, you yeah. know, but they're. There, like this, these bills are passing, and you talk about the 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 spending bill uh, that just passed with all this radical gender ideology, woke liberal craziness that's shoved in there, and it's passed. You know, I mean, the the far left guys didn't even vote for it; voted against it. Yeah, and then you got Republicans that did vote for it. Like, what's happening? No, it, it there's a frustration level. I I get it, and uh, you're right, Democrats. Uh, it seems like on these these big bills, they pack all kinds of crazy things in it. You know, the 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 bill they're debating this week, may, maybe even they may even pass it today. Um, that's going to spend an additional two trillion dollars. It's got all this, um, you know, it's got a bunch of tax increases in it. Yeah, uh, you know, it, a bunch more spending. It makes no sense. Um, I think just from an economic perspective, you, you know. The, the, well, said the other day that it seems to me the Democrats' economic plan is the dumbest plan in history because it's basically lock down the economy, spend like crazy, pay people not to work, and oh, for everyone who has been working, we're now going to raise your taxes. S such a deal. You know, like, right. that, that's what, like that. And, and, and in this $2 trillion bill that's going to exacerbate inflation and raise your taxes, there's a bunch of the crazy left cultural stuff too. They're like, right. what? Uh, but Again, back to the point, Democrats, they just keep driving with their left agenda, empowering government, and I think taking resources and, and rights away from, from we the people, which is what scares me, as I said before, what scares me the most. So what, what is your, I mean, greatest encouragement to, you know, if you were speaking to, you know, believers across the world that they love the Lord, they want to practice their faith, maybe they're a tad disillusioned with the political system. Mm -hmm. How do we? How do you give them hope? You know, we call it hold the line. How do they hold the line yeah. on some of these things? Uh, Americans have always risen to the challenge. Yeah. Um, you know, my, my favorite scripture verse is Second Timothy four seven, and Paul's the old guy giving advice to the young guy Timothy, and he says three things: fight the good fight, finish the course, keep the faith. And I tell people I love that verse because it's action. It's not wimpy. It's not. It's just like right. fight, finish keep love it and it's it's i i mean i'm sure pastors and would say i'm not you know interpreting exactly right but i feel like it's a verse for america because that captures the american attitude right and someone once said that in this country every third generation has had to do something big mm -hmm. and you start with the founders what they did was completely amazing it was a miracle right no one thought they could do this take on great britain start a country where freedom mattered and these guys were amazing what they put. Not perfect, but right. amazing. Right. Set up the greatest country ever. Three generations later, 
Lincoln and that generation of Americans ended the evil of slavery and kept the country together. That was, I mean, amazing. And then three generations after that, the greatest generation took on the evils of Nazi Germany, Imperial Japan, and won that war for the world. Unbelievable. And here we are now three generations later, wow. and it's, maybe it's our turn. Right. And the threat now is not maybe so much from outside, although China's a threat, right. but it's more inside with folks who think that the, the Constitution, the First Amendment, freedom, and, the, and, and free markets, who are, who are trying to change all that. And so we're going to have to stand up. I mean, you're doing it. You're, 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 doing, you're doing it and, and, and rallying people, bringing people together to, to emphasize the importance of faith, the importance of family, the importance yeah. of freedom in this country. So um, I learned a long time ago, too, it's never easy. Yeah. I mean, it's just you want to accomplish anything that matters, anything of significance, anything of lasting value. Yeah. It takes work. It takes effort. It takes, most importantly, it takes a willingness to assume the risk right. that's always associated with trying to do something worthwhile. There's always risk you might fail. There's always risk you're going to get attacked. But Americans have always been willing to take on the yeah. risk in, in a smart way, in, a, in, a, in, a, in the right way, fight for the things that matter. And that's that's what we got to do now. I always tell, you know, we, we in, in our journey um, across America in the last season, I always tell people, you know, the, the places of the greatest resistance always bring the greatest breakthrough. And I think right now, you know, <clears throat> just coming back, even coming back from the Middle East a few days ago, I, I want people to understand the stakes have never been higher. Yeah. Like the whole world is looking yep. on America and, and wondering, seriously, I was sitting with this guy in Northern Iraq, and they're all wondering, are they going to make it through this craziness? Like, and and if, if they don't make it, we're in trouble. Yeah. You know? And it's like, I feel like the stakes have never been higher. I mean... This is the season to pray. This is the season to yeah. fight. This is the season to stand. This is the season to, you know, uh, push past the mob, push yeah. past the censorship, you know. And that that I feel That's like you it. really embody that. Like you're, I think you're you're a hero to so many people across America because they see you fighting, you know. And I know you got the wrestler thing, and you know, but but in your spirit, you know, you you want to do the right thing, and it's so encouraging to so many people. Well, I'm, like I said, I'm just. I'm... Joe Bag of Donuts from Ohio who, 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 you know, trying to do the, the job I think you're supposed to do. But it's funny you point that out. My, Polly and I have had the opportunity to travel to Israel. You said you just came back from Iraq and in the Middle East. Uh, we've been to Israel five times. And it, it, it's, love Israel. It's, yeah, it's a, it's a, Polly, Polly says, so someday she wants to just move there for, <laughs> for, for, for months on, months on end. She'd have um, a great view of yeah, the end time. Yeah. The, uh, Thing go down. But when you're there, you talk with with uh, with with folks in Israel, and uh, amazing Jewish people, amazing people, and they they will they will they will tell you that because you know the, what's the best way America can help Israel, you know our best ally. What's and it's funny they'll say the best way you can help us, the be, whether they're private sector people, whether they're in the government, the best way you can help us is to stay strong. When it's America's true. strong, we're better. And the truth yeah. is, as you were, you were, you've said this. The truth is, when America leads, the world's a better place. It's true. With the values that make us special, when we, when, we, when we lead, the world is safer and better. And the truth is, you can't lead militarily, you can't lead diplomatically if you first don't lead economically, and you can't lead economically if you're not embracing the right values. It's it true. all builds that way. So right. that's why this is so important. The world is truly safer and better. It's never going to be perfect because it's a fallen world, right. but it's safer and better when we lead. And, and it's not for, and, and for us as a nation, you know, the whole America first movement, you know, doesn't mean we don't love everyone else. Doesn't mean we don't want right. to help oh, everyone else. Right. Doesn't mean, I mean, we go to, you know, before pre-COVID, I was in 20 something nations a year, right? Now helping a lot of people yeah. and doing a lot of stuff. But, you know, the older my kids begin to get, you know, four now, and I look yeah. at them and I'm like, what kind of future yeah, well said. are we passing off to these yeah. kids? And that that's actually why even... Ran for Congress. That's why I even engaged was because that, as a father, you know, yeah. I, my greatest desire is for my kids to be set up for success. And I was looking at what was happening yeah. politically. I was looking at what's happening in culture. I'm like, I don't know. I mean, they're going to schools where they're questioned if they're a boy or a girl. I mean, we have the craziest 
situation right now, yeah. way different than in the 90s when I grew up. Yeah, you know? uh, and much different than in the 70s. Yeah. <laughs> and so that's what really was the alarm that went off, like, okay, we need to, we, we got to stand for this. And the importance of what happens in America shaping yep. all these other nations well around the world. No, well, well said. You know, th- that one of the things that makes America the, this great place and it, and, and, and it continues to become even just the, the, what, what we've seen, how it's improved and everything over time too, is that, that fundamental concept you just talked about. Moms and dads making sacrifices for their kids so that then when their kids grow up, they can have life better than they did. Right. And then that generation in turn does it for the next. And right. it's, and we get this amazing thing called America. And that's that's a biblical yes. that's that's a biblical thing, like passing on that inheritance. Yep. Yep. You see so that all throughout the Bible. All right, well let's talk about your book. Okay. <laughs> I'm excited about this. Well, thank you. Tell us about it. Tell us first of all, this is I heard a story from some of his staff. Is it true that you wrote an entire book? On your legal pad. I did. I did. I'm old. I can't type. And so I, I did. And some of it I wrote while, God bless my wife, when we, sometimes we drive from Ohio to D.C. And so she'd be, you know, because I'm working the phones and all, she would drive it. And it's just like a seven hour, seven and a half hour drive. So I'd write then. I'd write at home on the weekends. Um, write in session? Yeah. Just when you're bored? Yeah. <laughs> no, I don't do that. <laughs> the, uh, but uh, yeah, I write it all out longhand. Um, I'm just old school. I got to have that yell. That's how I get ready for committee hearings is, you know, this question, this question. Okay, what order and how am I going to ask what he's going to say? So I'm just used to that. But yeah, the title says it. That's that's what I, we talked about it earlier. Um, you should do what you told the voters you were going to do. Right. And, and we talk about that in the book. Um, I, I, I write about the Freedom Caucus, write about how we came together, a group okay. of nine of us. Uh, decided we're going to form this group where we were. You know, our mission statement is, uh, you know, there's there's countless number of people around the country who feel like this town's forgotten them. Our job is to remember them and fight for them and do what we said we would do. So, talk about that. Talk about when we decided to make a change in speaker. Mm-hmm. Um, you know, Mark Meadows, one of my best friends, offered this motion to vacate the chair, and we wound up a long process. But John Boehner wound up stepping down as speaker of the house and. And a host of other things. I get in the investigations. We, 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 oh, that's the juicy yeah, stuff. Yeah. So it, you know, when the when the IRS targeted people, Benghazi, yeah. um, and of course impeachment, spent a lot of time on okay. that. Okay. And what I try to do is is take your 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 listeners and viewers, um, the reader, behind the scenes, so they right. can sort of figure yeah. out how it works in Congress, right. uh, how these investigations work, and and I try to give some some interesting stories and funny story. I talk about it, uh, during impeachment. We were doing all the depositions in the bunker in the basement of the Capitol, and Adam Schiff was running this secret stuff. And it was truly secret. You couldn't. But uh, there was one day where my buddies, uh, Steve Scalise and Matt Gates and a group of members just stormed, the, the, you know, t- the, of course, the headlines in the press stormed the bunker. They didn't really storm the bunker. The door was open. They walked in, and, it, you know, and Adam Schiff tried to kick him out, and then he got all mad and adjourned because it was kind of like a little hearing deposition. Um, and they called me back to his office, and you know, it was just, it was a, it's kind of an interesting thing how Schiff reacted during his whole thing. So I, I try to give some of those uh, kind of kind of stories in the book, and then spend a lot of time about uh, talking about President Trump, who is, is I probably told every audience I've ever talked to uh, here in the last several years, I wish I wish every American could meet President Trump, because yeah. when you do, and I know you have, and you spent time with him, you cannot help but like him. Yeah. There's an energy about this guy, a charisma, uh, the, his love Insane for a country, energy. for our yeah, it, uh, unbelievable. I mean, he's called me at all hours, and uh, and I hang out with Meadows, and I and Meadows getting calls after midnight and everything. Else. So, um, but he loves the country, and yeah. he loves regular people making yeah. it happen. So I, I I try to give the reader some some um, some of those. Uh, it's fascinating as well. that a multi billionaire can have a better grasp on the needs and the desires of everyday Americans. Yep. That to me is just yeah, incredible. He uh I was I was in New York uh this a few years ago and I was uh, in on a Saturday night and I had to I, I check in the hotel and I had to go do a TV thing. So I leave and I come back and the the the, the bell guy and the bellhop guy and the and the other people working in the staff there at the hotel they had seen me and come back. And they come back and they're like because they know, you know, this is during like the, the whole uh, Mueller investigation. All right. they knew I was fighting for the president, and they're like that. And I go to my room, and they've 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 put out the special food and, and stuff for me, and they have a little note there. Thanks for fighting for president, because they love the president, because right. the presidents took time to talk right, to these guys totally. at yeah. some random hotel in, right. in New York. Yeah, exactly. Because he cares about regular people, yeah. and and it. Uh, 
I, I just feel privileged that, that Polly and I have got to spend time around him, and I've gotten to know him, and he is a good man who wants to do good for our country. And what the press has tried to do to him is just ridiculous. But So we talk a lot about that in the book as well. That's amazing. When does it come out? How can people get it? You can go. You can order. You can pre-order now at uh, Barnes and Noble or Amazon online and pre-order. It comes out next Tuesday. And um, um, you know, like I said, I think it's a quick read, 250 pages, and it's it's a it's written in a way I think you just you kind of just can move right through it. So it's uh, but it'll be fun. It'll take them behind the scenes, and I think they'll enjoy it. Well, thank you for writing this. Well, thank I'm you. excited. I I love books like this that, and I think we need more of them that help kind of demystify. The process of what's happening so mm -hmm. Americans can really see it. And yeah. so we're I'm excited about that. Well, thank you. Thank you. Thanks so much for joining us. Thanks for a what you Any do so last much. words you have to about uh, around holding the line, any last things to Americans to No, we always say in wrestling, you know, you get <laughs> you're getting ready for a big match, we always say you, you know, bring the diesel. Like bring, bring <laughs> I love home. that. And you do. You you bring the energy, the you bring the diesel. And so uh it's a it's an American kind of mindset. And so uh, fight the good fight, finish the course, keep the faith, and bring the diesel is probably a good way to end it. Bring the diesel, we should call the podcast. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> I don't know about that. <laughs> Thanks so much. Thank Thanks you, so Sean. much for being on. You I appreciate bet. it. Take care.